Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello viewers, welcome to this next lecture on the MOOC course on Mathematical Portfolio Theory. You would recall that so far in the mean variance framework, uh, we talked about uh, how to optimize a portfolio and we talked about efficient frontier and we dwelled upon two important lines namely the capital market line and the security market line uh, which is also known as CAPM. So, in today's lecture, we will conclude our discussion on the mean variance framework. Uh, with a particular topic namely the performance of the portfolio and how to analyze that. So, accordingly uh, we will look at uh, various measures or ways uh, or the classical ways of uh, measuring how a portfolio is performing uh, and then we will see that how they are sort of related to each other and can be obtained as transformations of each other under uh, some specified circumstances. So, let us start off our discussion on portfolio performance evaluation. Now, in order to motivate this, let us just talk about uh, mutual fund returns. So, mutual fund is a uh, sort of the most commonly uh, used term or the most familiar term that you can get uh, to a portfolio. So, accordingly I start off with this and state the following that the returns from mutual funds are computed from their net asset value per share and the net asset value is abbreviated as NAV, another term you might be familiar with. And a portfolios, so I have to define what is the NAV. So, a portfolios NAV per share of the mutual fund at time t is defined as NAVT is market value of all assets at time t and that means the all assets in the mutual fund minus portfolios total liability at time t divided by the total number of shares outstanding and by outstanding I mean that they, they are being held by investors at time t. Uh, so, this is a very simple concept that uh, the NAV is essentially the, uh, the current valuation per share of the mutual fund. So, when you buy mutual fund you basically buy the number of units of the mutual fund. So, then uh, it is given by the uh, market value of all the assets that means the actual uh, value that you will get if you decide to liquidate all the assets that are in the mutual fund and minus the portfolio's total liability. So, whatever liability you have at time t you subtract them to the total assets that are being held in the portfolio and then this means that this is the net amount of money that the mutual fund actually has uh, in case it is liquidated and uh, or uh, in case it decide to sell off the assets and this is basically the current valuation at time t and then this valuation that means this is the value of the assets and then this is the va this value of the assets is essentially in the ownership of all the people who have purchased units of the mutual fund. So, that means for per unit of the mutual fund 
you have to uh, take this total amount and divide it by the number of mutual funds that are still outstanding or being held by uh, investors like uh, you know like uh, small investors financial institutions and so on so this will give you basically the valuation of the mutual fund per unit of that particular mutual fund okay so now uh, accordingly the holding period so remember that at the end of the day, we will make the evaluation of the portfolio uh, in terms of uh, how it is performing uh, driven by the basic motivation that an investor invests uh, in risky assets with the intent of maximizing their uh, terminal wealth. So accordingly for the holding period return, so the holding period return which is often called HPR is defined as H P R T. What is this going to be? This is going to be the return is going to be N A V T minus N A V T minus 1 that means the change in the N A V in the time period plus D T plus G T divided by N A V T minus 1. So, this means that if the valuation of the per unit of the mutual fund at time t minus was NAV t minus 1 and then it becomes NAV t at time t. So, that means the return exclusively from its net asset value is going to be NAV t minus NAV t minus 1 divided by NAV t minus 1. However, we need to account for certain other things, some other income streams that can actually come in between time t minus 1 and time t. So, for that we have two terms d t and g t and I will explain what these terms are. So, here your uh, d t is disbursement that means the payout by the mutual fund uh, in the so disbursement of interest in the book value of the mutual fund and G T is essentially disbursement of capital gains realized when securities are sold for period t so uh, this uh, disbursement this also i specify for period t and this is not only interest it could also mean dividends and this navt minus navt minus 1 this is the change in the mutual funds N A V for time t. Uh, so, this is the unrealized gains or losses. Uh, so, just to go through this again, see N A V t minus N A V t minus 1, it is going to be the change in the uh, mutual funds N A V in the intervening period t and t minus 1 and this difference of valuation comes as a result of the assets that are that were held at time t minus 1 and are still being held at time t. Now, between time t minus 1 and t, t, there are two types of incomes that can come. One is that the dividends being paid on the assets that are being held by the mutual fund in case it is a stock or interest in case it is a bond. So, they are going to pass this on to their uh, to the investors in the mutual fund and that is what is known as the disbursement of the uh, uh, interest or dividends and this g of t is the disbursement of capital's gains as a result of selling of some of the assets between time 0 and t minus uh, between time t minus 1 and t. So, this means that between time t minus 1 and t three things can happen either you will get some interest or dividends which is reflected in the term d t or some assets are sold in which case you have a capital's gains or loss which is indicated by the term g t 
and then of course assets that are still being held and then the difference between these two as a result of the market movement between time t minus 1 and time t is given by NAVT minus NAVT minus 1. And this again, so this, so these three uh, income streams as a proportion, uh, the, namely these income streams of NAVT mi minus T minus 1, DT and GT, the sum total of this as a proportion of the NAV at the beginning of the period can be reconciled to get the definition of the holding period or a single period return on the mutual fund. All right. So, now we come to uh, the portfolio performance analysis measures and we will essentially look at uh, primarily three measures. So, let me start off with the, these measures which are known as single parameter portfolio performance measure. Okay, so, I will begin with a, a little bit of a narrative on this. So, uh, the more uh, sophisticated approaches to uh, analysis of performance of investment portfolios takes into account both the rate of return and risk from the portfolio. Uh, so, this means that you know this uh, portfolio performance measures again are uh, presented in the paradigm of the mean variance framework namely that you look at what is the rate of return and the risk and reconcile them to find an indicator which will give you a mechanism of uh, choosing the performance of different, uh, uh, different funds or portfolios and make a judicious decision as far as the investment is concerned. So, accordingly uh, driven by this mean variance framework. Uh, three individuals namely William Sharp, Jack Trainer, and uh, Michael Jensen have developed models for performance measure that simultaneously includes uh, both the pillars of, uh, of the Markowitz framework namely uh, return and risk while at the same time allowing for rankings in terms of desirability of portfolios. Uh, so, this means that these three individuals uh, came upon with uh, certain ways of measuring the performance in portfolio. This is based on the return and the risk and in this case the risk could mean both the standard deviation or the beta as the case might be and we will see you know uh, the corresponding cases for sigma p and beta p and how it is being used. And the reason for doing this is that it will basically uh, gives a way of our single point indicator of evaluating the performance of the portfolio with the intent of ranking them in terms of desirability from the point of view of investment. So, we start off with the, uh, the first of this uh, due to William Sharp and this is what is known as Sharp's reward to 
variability ratio. Okay, so, what uh, the motivation for this is that the sharp uh, subtracted from each funds average or the expected rate of return denoted by ERP or in this case we will just write RP bar, this is the expected return on the portfolio and estimate of the risk free interest rate uh, which we have already defined as RF. Now, this difference is called risk premium or excess return. Uh, so, as already highlighted, uh, this difference of the expected return on the portfolio, which is actually a risky portfolio as compared to a risk free return that you would have gone by just uh, investing in a completely uh, risk free bond such as a government bond. This additional difference is an indication of the gain that you expect to make because as an investor you have chosen to take the risk instead of choosing a more safe path of making your investment in a risk free asset. So, however, uh, coming to the drawback that prompted Markowitz to uh, introduce the mean variance framework that this difference is not uh, exclusively enough to indicate how the portfolio is performing because lot of times it might happen that this difference that means the excess return that you are getting might be accompanied by a commensurate amount of a high level of risk. And that is the reason why all these measures are driven by the mean variance framework which takes into account both the return and the risk. So, uh, we now have to uh, look at a certain uh, a, a little bit of uh, an extension of this and not just confine ourselves to the risk premium or the excess return. And accordingly, uh, what Sharp did was then he divided uh, this risk premium of each portfolio by the standard deviation of its returns, namely sigma p. Uh, so, this sigma p is essentially the risk measure of portfolios total risk. Uh, so, uh, thus the Sharpe's uh, index or sometimes it is called the Sharpe's ratio is defined as, so motivated by this it will be uh, S p for Sharpe. And first we take the uh, risk premium and we divide it by the total risk and this is R p bar minus R f on the numerator divided by sigma p in the denominator. So, uh, thus uh, to uh, interpret this, so thus the sharp uh, index or ratio, so we will use the term index or ratio interchangeably, it combines both return and risk into a single uh, index number namely S subscript p which can be used to rank investment alternatives. So, uh, this means that uh, what you can do is that you can look at various investment alternatives that means a collection of portfolios and for each case uh, 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 we can actually calculate the sharp ratio and then 
I use the sharp ratio to rank the desirability of the portfolios and then accordingly uh, make an investment in a portfolio or a mutual fund that is more desirable. All right, so now let us move on uh, to the next index due to trainer. So this is trainers reward to risk ratio. So what trainer did was uh, he suggested regressing the holding period return recall that this was HPR from mutual funds uh, denoted by a sigma p onto returns from the, uh, so this is actually RP. So, uh, it suggested that uh, you, you regress RP onto returns from the market index whose return is uh, denoted by RM. So, th this is the same framework as the single index model. Uh, that is, he suggested the model. Uh, so, it is a single index model. Now, I am just modifying this for a portfolio P instead of an asset I. So, R P T plus alpha P plus beta P R M T plus epsilon P T for uh, T is equal to 1, 2 all the way to capital T. Uh, where as before your alpha p and beta p are intercept and slope for the portfolio p. So, this means that it is these are the uh, intercept and uh, slope uh, resulting from uh, regressing the return on the portfolio onto the return on the market. All right. Uh, so now, let's talk about beta p. And uh, beta p, by definition, what is this going to be? It is going to be the covariance of the return of portfolio with that of the market divided by sigma m square. And this is covariance of return on the portfolio is summation w i r i t i is equal to one to n into r m t by sigma m square and this is equal to uh, so i can use the linearity property of covariance so this will be summation i is equal to 1 to n w i covariance of r i t r m t over sigma m square and remember this term by definition is going to be beta i so this is summation w i i is equal to 1 to n summation w i beta i into i equal to 1 to n. So, this means that the beta of the portfolio is simply going to be the expected uh, the, the, uh, the weighted sum of the betas of the individual assets. So, this is very similar uh, to the expression for the return of the portfolio which is the weighted sum of the returns of the each individual asset. Okay, so, this essentially gives you a way of calculating what is going to be the beta of the portfolio once you have uh, made an assessment uh, and determine what is going to be the beta of each of the individual assets. Okay, so, coming back to uh, trainers uh, reward to volatility ratio for portfolio P. Uh, denoted, so naturally we are going to denote this by T subscript P, it will make use of the portfolios beta as the risk measure. So, this is in contrast to using uh, standard deviation as the risk measure in case of the sharp ratio. So, now we are going to use beta as the measure of 
risk. Alright, so uh, coming back to this uh, portfolio's beta as the risk measure and uh, accordingly we define TP as being excess return or risk premium over portfolios beta and uh, this is going to be uh, excess return as before is RP bar minus RF divided by portfolios beta which is beta P. Alright, so let us now come to the last of the three measures and that is what is known as the uh, Jensen's measure. Alright, so like trainers measure, Jensen's measure is based on the implications of CAPM. Uh, so, accordingly recall the expression for CAPM or SML. Uh, you would recall that this is the expected return of portfolio. So, I am looking at this in the context of portfolio is equal to RF plus E RM minus RF into beta P. So, what Jensen did was to look at this CAPM uh, and make some rearrangement. So, uh, Jensen rearranged the CAPM or the SML to obtain the following. Uh, so, what Jensen did was actually looked at the re expected return of the portfolio RP bar and subtracted the expected return given by CAPM which is RF that means this expression on the right hand side plus ERM minus RF into beta P and call this to be alpha P. Alright, uh, so now uh, we note that the term, so there are two terms here, this is RP bar and this is the expression from cap M. Uh, so, let us look at term by term. So, this uh, first term RP bar uh, is the actual realized that means the actual uh, obtained return on portfolio P and the term the second term which is RF plus uh, E RM minus RF into beta P this term is the return given by the cap M. Uh, so, accordingly the difference between these two namely alpha p this is the difference between the portfolios realized performance and the performance as predicted by CAPM. So, uh, consequently this term alpha p measures the desirability of a portfolio P. And uh, note that alpha P is sometimes referred to as 
Janssen's alpha. All right. Uh, so, to just sum it up, what did we have? We first talked about sharp ratio, and sharp ratio talked about the excess uh, return that you are getting uh, from the portfolio over a risk free investment and it was divided by sigma p to indicate the extent to which this was eroded by the risk as given by the, the, the standard deviation of the portfolio. And then you could use this to rank different alternative investment choice. Uh, on the other hand, in case of the trainer ratio, the risk uh, measure that was used was uh, no longer sigma p uh, or the standard deviation, but was the beta of the portfolio. And Janssen alpha is a measure that was designed in the paradigm of CAPM. And uh, it basically said that uh, they took, what he did was he took uh, the CAPM return as given by the formula of RF plus ERM minus RF into beta p as some sort of benchmark and then uh, looked at the return of the portfolio and wanted to measure the extent to which the realized return of the portfolio exceeded that of the benchmark return as predicted by CAPM and hired this positive value of, uh, so he ideally you want your alpha p to be positive and as high as possible. So, the higher the value of alpha, the more desirable is the investment in the corresponding portfolio for which this alpha p has been determined. Okay, now that we have identified these single three single parameter uh, measures in order to ascertain the performance of the portfolio, let us now uh, try to dwell a little bit on how they are correlated to each other and see if there exists some sort of an uh, equivalence behavior in terms of the qualitative assessment of the portfolio performance. So, accordingly we uh, begin with uh, the topic of contrasting the uh, three models and by this the th uh, so I will use the word models ratio and index interchangeably. So, uh, the sharp trainer and Zensen portfolio performance measure as defined uh, above are all positive linear transformation of each other. So, basically uh, their transformation of each other taken two at a time uh, under some uh, plausible that means it can happen circumstances. All right. So, uh, Zensen uh, recognizing that not all assets lie on the CAPM, which is why he looked at the difference of the realized return and uh, the return predicted by CAPM added a constant term. Uh, that is the Janssen's alpha alpha pre and rewrote the SML model as what? As R p bar minus R f is equal to alpha p plus R m bar minus R f. So, R m bar here is the expected return uh, of the market portfolio into beta p where alpha p, so in equilibrium I will have r p bar minus r f equal to this which is the cap m. So, alpha p is an additional term that has shown up which has disturbed the equilibrium as given by the cap m. So, accordingly I can make the statement that the alpha p is an indicator or is indicative of the disequilibrium of the portfolio P. So, that means the extent to which uh, the equilibrium as given by CAPM has been disturbed. Okay. Uh, now, what we do is that now we divide both sides by beta P to obtain. So, remember that once we have beta P, so we can now relate this to uh, the trainer ratio 
to obtain the trainer ratio which was T p is equal to R p bar minus R f over beta p. So, this will become alpha p over beta p plus R m bar minus R f. So, this means that T p is basically it uh, involves alpha p beta p plus constant. So, I can say that the trainers measure T p is a linear transformation. So, we can view this as that T p has this linear transformation R m bar minus R f and then has a factor of alpha p over beta p. So, this is a linear transformation of Zensen's measure alpha p because remember that R m bar minus R f is a constant. Now, uh, further Sharpe's measure may be derived by noting that beta p by definition is sigma p m over uh, uh, sigma m square and sigma p m can be given as rho p m into sigma p into sigma m by definition of correlation coefficient divided by sigma m square. So, therefore, we can have that R p bar minus R f which was given as alpha p plus R m bar minus R f. This instead of this beta p, so uh, what I am doing is that I am just replacing the value of beta p uh, in the in the Jensen's alpha relation with rho p m sigma p sigma m over sigma m square. So, we considered a plausible circumstance that for a well diversified portfolio rho p m is approximately 1. So, therefore, we get uh, S p which is R p bar minus R f divided by sigma p will be approximately alpha p over sigma p plus R m bar minus R f over sigma m. So, notice that here this sigma m will cancel out leaving only one sigma m in the denominator which is here. Rho is 1 and this sigma p will be removed as a result of division. So, essentially we have divided by uh, sigma p. Uh, so, from this relation uh, thus sharp measure uh, S p is a linear transformation of Jensen's alpha. Uh, so, we, we have uh, looked at Jensen's alpha and its relation to the trainer ratio and the sharp ratio. So, we are only left with the one combination how to connect the trainer and the sharp ratio. So, finally, T p and S p can be linked to each other accordingly we recall that what was T p? T p was R p bar minus R f over beta p. Now, as before we will substitute beta p. So, what you will get is that this will become R p bar minus R f and the beta p is going to be rho p m sigma p sigma m by sigma m square. And uh, this is R p bar minus R f over rho p m into sigma p multiplied by sigma m, 
which is approximately R p bar minus R f over sigma p into sigma m uh, taking rho p m approximately 1 for a well diversified portfolio. And this you recollect that this term is nothing but S of p multiplied by sigma m. Thus, T p and S p are approximately linear transformation of each other. Uh, and before I forget, I, I just want to point out one thing that I have assumed that uh, the rho p m is approximately 1 for a well diversified portfolio. Uh, the reason for doing is that if your portfolio p is well diversified, the more and more diversified is it, uh, it is the closer you are getting to the market portfolio. That means, you are closer you are getting uh, to the portfolio mimicking the market portfolio m and accordingly the correlation coefficient will keep approaching 1. Okay, so, now what we have is that we have now uh, a collation of all these three results where we took at the trainer sharp, uh, trainer and sharp ratios and the Jensen's alpha and then we saw that how each of them is essentially a linear transformation of the other uh, in specific circumstances. In particular, uh, one circumstance that we particularly identified was that for a well diversified portfolio the correlation coefficient of the portfolio P and M is approximately equal to 1. All right, so now we come to just one last topic and this is what is known as the index of total uh, portfolio risk or which is ITPR and the portfolio beta. Okay, so, uh, for this uh, we note that the relationship between a portfolio systematic risk, remember that we had introduced the term systematic and unsystematic risk uh, beta and its total risk that is a standard deviation may be seen more clearly in terms of the ITPR and which is defined as as sigma p over sigma m. So, in some sense it is an indicator of uh, the risk of the portfolio vis-a-vis -vis the risk of the market portfolio as given by the standard deviation which is uh, what is known as the total risk or the uh, or you can view this as the unsystematic uh, risk. Uh, so, accordingly we recall the expression for the single index model done in the previous class and we have sigma p square is equal to beta p square sigma m square plus sigma square epsilon p. Uh, remember that this is a, a total risk and this is systematic and this is unsystematic. Okay, now, uh, if uh, a portfolio p is efficient, so, if the portfolio P is efficient, then its diversifiable variance, that means the unsystematic risk, must be 0. Uh, so, this means that sigma square epsilon P, this term is equal to 0. Uh, so, consequently, what do we have? So, consequently from this relation we have sigma p square is equal to beta p square sigma m square. Uh, so, taking square root, what do we have? 
we have uh, i t p r which is beta p uh, which is actually uh, sigma p over sigma m by definition is equal to beta p. Okay, so, uh, so we have shown that sigma p over sigma m is beta p. Uh, there is an alternate uh, definition for this or ap approach of uh, uh, deriving this. So, beta p is rho p m sigma p sigma m over sigma m square and this is approximately for a well diversified portfolio this is going to be 1 into sigma p over sigma m which is sigma p over sigma m uh, and this is again i t p r right uh, so, and the reason is that uh, rho p m is approximately 1 for efficient portfolios or which is well diversified portfolio so which is the reason why we, we took this to be equal to 0. Now, the, this entire premise of having uh, this uh, ITPR uh, to be uh, equal to beta p is uh, driven by the assumption that the portfolio p is going to be efficient. But of course, we now have to account for the scenario where the portfolio did not be uh, so, that is it could be inefficient. So, accordingly uh, in case of inefficient portfolio where you have not been able to get rid of the uh, of the diversifiable component of the risk. So, that means the one which contains the diversifiable risk in sigma square epsilon p, you will get that i t p r uh, square. This by definition is going to be sigma p square sigma m square. Now, sigma p square is going to be beta p square sigma m square from the decomposition uh, resulting from the single index model plus sigma square epsilon p divided by sigma m square and this obviously is going to be greater than beta p square. Uh, so, taking square root we get i t p r to be greater than beta of All right. Uh, so, just to sum up what we have done is that uh, we have started to look at the concept of comparing different portfolios and ranking them in terms of desirability. And in order to do this ranking, we have identified the three classical uh, measures of desirability, namely the Sharp ratio, uh, which is the excess return over risk as given by sigma p, the trainer ratio again. Uh, the risk premium uh, over the beta and then Zensis alpha which is indicative of the excess uh, 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 better performance given by the portfolio in terms of return as compared to the uh, return at the equilibrium as given by cap m and we concluded by talking about the notion of ITPR. So, this concludes our discussion on the mean variance portfolio theory. And uh, from the next lecture, we will start talking about the framework for the non-mean variance portfolio theory. Thank you for watching.